Awesome. Greetings. Happy Tuesday. Um, is everyone ready to get into it? Awesome. Can you hear me okay? My voice? Okay. Lovely. Um, happy Tuesday. My name is Ade. I use they, them pronouns. I am part of the GEO Collective and I'm co-hosting this event with some of our other GEO Collective members on this call that you'll meet soon. I'm based in the Piedmont bioregion of North Carolina on Five Band Saponi Nation land. Um, and unfortunately, one of our panelists tonight couldn't join us um, for a personal emergency. So we're sending you love, Morning Star Gali, and I hope that you and your family are well. Um, and so we're going to do a quick intro of our other collective members and then get into the juicy part of, of conversation. We'll also do a um, land acknowledgement and some grounding as well that Jessica is gonna lead us through. And I'll be sharing a poem before we jump in. Um, so the music that you just heard was off of this recent release um, by Dynamism, which you know is also me. <laughs> Let me not be mysterious about it. That's my creative side. Um, this is my economic organizing side. Um, but yeah, that is the link. If you're interested in learning more about the work I do creatively, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and did we want, do you want to introduce yourself, Abe, and then Jessica can lead us in a land acknowledgement? Sure. Hi, I'm Abe Gresswitz. I'm another member of Geo, the GEO Collective. Um, happy to be part of this tonight. Very excited for the discussion. Um, yeah. If you would like to take us into the land acknowledgement, Jessica, and yeah, we'll move from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, thanks to the interpreters. Um, but I wanted to make sure we did um, a land and, and ancestors and elders acknowledgements. So first, I would like to acknowledge the original stewards of the land, wherever you are. I'm in uh, Lenape Nations territory. And I want to make sure we start by recognizing um, our claim to land and resources, indigenous people and people of color's claim to land and resources. I want to bring our ancestors into the room and acknowledge our elders as well. Um, my particular ancestors uh, to recognize both the struggles of enslaved laborers and all those who continue to labor without just compensation. I want to acknowledge our histories of agency, cooperation, and resistance, and all those resistors, cooperators, and freedom fighters throughout history um, and currently. And let us bring in anybody, any of our ancestors, any of us want to bring in, let them, let them be here with us and support us and strengthen us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, and I wanted to offer a poem by, um, by Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota uh, native, Dennis Smith. And it's called, Say It With Your Whole Black Mouth. Say it with your whole black mouth. I am innocent. And if you are not innocent, say this, I am worthy of forgiveness, of breath after breath. I tell you this, I let blue eyes dress me in guilt, walked around stores convinced the very skin of my palm was stolen. What good has it brought? Days filled flinching, thinking the sirens were reaching for me. And when the sirens were mine, did I not make peace with God? So many white people are alive because we know how to control ourselves. How many times have we died on a whim? 
wielded like gallows in their sunshine hands. Here, standing in my own body, I say, next time. They murder us for the crime of their imaginations. I don't know what I'll do. I did not come to preach of peace, for that's not the hunted's duty. I came here to say what I can't say without my name being added to a list. What my mother fears I will say, what she wishes to say herself. I came here to say, I can't bring myself to write it down. Sometimes I dream of pulling an apology from a pig's collared neck and wake up cracking it. If I dream of setting fire to cul-de-sacs, I wake up chained to the bed. I don't like thinking about doing to white folks what white folks done to us. When I do, can't say I don't dance. Oh, my people, how long will we reach for God instead of something sharper? Donna Smith, homie, really great um, poet, um, queer, and pause out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, so we will move into a quick introduction of grassroots economic organizing. Um, and so some of the words are here and I'll just read the first paragraph for folks. And then Esteban, if you would love to introduce um, your org, who's also sponsoring this event. So grassroots economic organizing is a decentralized collective of educators, researchers, and grassroots activists working to promote an economy based on democratic participation, worker and community ownership, social and economic justice and ecological sustainability, a solidarity economy through grassroots journalism, organizing support, cross-sector networking and movement building, as well as the publication of educational materials. And if you haven't been yet, please go check out the website. There's so much there to dig into. You are also welcome to become a volunteer um, and instructions on how to join the collective and contribute are there as well. Um, and next up, United States Federation. Of worker co-ops. Of worker co-ops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I have to harp on that because uh, if you abbreviate, the, that's the wrong half. It makes us sound like, true, we're true. like the, F the FBI or something. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> It's the U.S. Fed. And it's like, quick, hit the decks. Um, no, so we're the Worker Co-op Federation, also known as the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. And uh, we are so happy to co-sponsor this event. It was interesting um, digging back into the, the GEO uh, purpose and, and mission and, um, and, and getting to see that on the screen, some of the groups that GEO is affiliated with because we swim in the same water. We have the same mission and purpose. We are members of all the same things. <laughs> and um, we just, we approach it in different ways. And I think that that is an expression of um, the diversity of tactics that our movements need to um, embody. Even if you have the same vision and the same purpose and you're vibing on the same values and principles, right? So the USFWC is the only national grassroots membership-based organization for worker-owned cooperative businesses um, here. Um, and in addition to some of the affiliations we have in, in each other's networks within the US, we're also uh, part of the connection for an internationalist framework around the social solidarity economy um, and uh, worker ownership and mutualism. So we're members um, indirectly of the International Cooperative Alliance and of CICOPA, which is the International Worker Co-op Federation. Um, so we, I, I won't actually rehash, we have the same exact mission as GEO, um, but we do it in a different way as a chamber of commerce, um, sort of like a blend between uh, union and a, uh, a trade association. Um, and we, we sort of organize and mobilize our members in a lot of different grassroots 
um, advocacy councils and, and, and programs um, to build out the social e e uh, infrastructure around a solidarity economy uh, with a focus on worker ownership. And uh, we do that in, in four specific councils other than our international committee, uh, which is a Union Co-ops Council, Policy and Advocacy Council, an Immigrant uh, Co-op Workers Council, and a Racial and Economic Justice Council. So we're very happy to be co-sponsoring today. Right on, thank you Esteban. Um, and so we're just gonna do a brief kind of recap of our part one. Abe is gonna take us through that and then um, we will bounce back to the conversationalists, the panelists who y'all came to you know, listen to. So Abe, what's the recap? All right, I'll just give this to you briefly because I'm sure you are all very excited about the conversation. So last time around, we did a bit of a introduction to the topic itself, how cooperatives can work well for the abolition movement and what the abolition movement can bring to cooperatives. We went through the history of some of the panelists in this work. And um, this time we're gonna go into a deeper dive. We're gonna go into talking about how to make this happen. We're gonna talk about some, some of, uh, some of the, more of the details than we did last time. And I'm really excited to see this. And Esfan, if you could pick up there and introduce um, Lydia, our new panelist. Yeah, I was gonna say one of the things, one of the first things that I said, and um, thankfully, uh, there's access on the geo site to the recording of uh, of that first session. You can either watch it as one slog on YouTube or it's broken up into the different topical um, the questions that we sort of moved through as a panel. Um, so as a as a proxy for recapping that, I will I would just draw uh, direct your attention to that. Um, and one of the first things that I mentioned in in the panel, which was seven months ago, almost to the exact day, y'all. Uh, was I cited how uh, important and foundational my my uh, comradeship and collaboration um, with Lydia Pello Hobbs was um, in shaping my understanding of, of racial capitalism and of abolition. Um, and so uh, again, I'm not gonna say again what I said that back then, but now we actually have the real deal, which is the pleasure of Lydia Pello Hobbs joining us here. Um, she is a assistant professor of geography and African-American and Africana studies at the University of Kentucky um, and is one of the founders of my co-op, Aorta. She transitioned out of Aorta um, in 2019, great, uh, November of 2019, and, um, and is based in New Orleans. Um, and we're gonna get to hear a lot about Lydia's work and, and leadership and scholarship and organizing uh, which is just so rich and so timely, um, given her deep history in cooperative organizing um, in the Midwest, as a board member with NASCO, as a member from um, the Oberlin Student Cooperative Association, um, and, uh, and all kinds of other cooperative organizing. So you really um, embody really what the this, this nexus that we're um, digging into about um, both understanding prisons um, and abolition frameworks and the kind of cooperative future that we're trying to transition to. Um, the last thing that I will, well, maybe I won't say it, but invite you to speak to Lydia uh, when we get into your like fuller intro of, of the work you do is actually around your dissertation work. Um, Lydia was a, a, a student of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who we talked about a lot in um, the last panel. It, it wouldn't be a conversation about racial capitalism or prison abolition if we, if we hadn't. Um, and so uh, Dr. Gilmore was your advisor um, in your dissertation work on the Angola prison in, in Louisiana. Um, and I think that a lot of that thinking and some of the panels that you've done with the Movement for Black Lives around abolitionist futures um, is, uh, is, all, is all up for grabs in our conversation today. Thanks for joining us, Lydia. Thanks, Esteban. Yes, yeah, so glad to have you here. And I just wanted to give folks a real quick of the rest of the flow. So we're gonna move into introductions, short introductions of everyone and folks will really kind of fishbowl. So the panelists will be really connecting and talking with each other. Um, 
about how their different works and perspectives intersect. Um, and then we'll have a short intermission, music break with Jay Reed. Um, and then the last half will really give space for more Q&A and panelist audience interaction. So I hope that sounds lovely for you all. Um, Jessica, would you like to start us off with an intro and then y'all can go around and go from there. Thanks. So my name is Jessica Gordon Emhard. Um, she and her pronouns. I am a member of the GEO Collective. I'm also professor of uh, community justice and social economic development at John Jay College, City University of New York. I'm the author of um, Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice. Oh, and I need to talk slower for the interpreters. So I'll slow it down. Um, I, actually, I think that's enough uh, introduction, except to also say that I'm a mother and a grandmother of um, both um, Black men and women and children. And so um, I care deeply about the future. Uh, Ed, why don't you introduce yourself? I'd be glad to. Uh, I'm Ed Whitfield. I'm formerly the co-managing director of the Fund for Democratic Communities. Currently, I am a senior fellow with C. Thomas Organization and also one of the founders of a group we put together here in Clarksdale, Mississippi, where I've moved to called the Delta Commons Group. Um, and I've been, uh, I'm old, as old as dirt, nearly. And so I've been in a lot of places and times. Originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, lived 50 years in North Carolina. And we did a lot of support for the cooperative movement uh, when I was working with the foundation, the Fund for Democratic Communities. And I continue to support that work through now my involvement with Seed Commons most directly. Thank you. How about um, maybe uh, I'll go I've next. Had... I'll go next and then pass it to Lydia who can go a little deeper into her work than our brief intros. Um, so my okay. my name's, thank you. My name's Esteban, uh, I use he and him. I'm based on Lene Lenape land here <clears throat> in what is currently known as Philadelphia. Um, and I, in addition to being the executive director for the US Federation of Worker Co-ops, I'm also a worker owner and co-founder of AORTA, uh, which stands for Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. It's a small cooperative um, that is working to catalyze movements for social, racial, and climate justice, um, bringing facilitation, consulting, and um, and modeling conflict resolution and some of the skills that we need uh, in, in these movements. Um, I mentioned on the first round of this, some of the work that I did uh, as a volunteer outside of my, my paid labor with a grassroots collective called Philly Stands Up um, that works on transformative justice, specifically um, in the, the very small and intimate work of, of working with people who've caused harm in sexual assault situations um, and in, uh, in, in alignment with uh, survivor support collectives. Um, and doing a lot of political education and and um, and training around what those models look like and how to practice them, um, and uh, I'm bringing some of that into this conversation as well. All right, now we're going to kick it to Lydia, who we get to hear from, uh, and uh, maybe you can both introduce yourself and then say a little bit about the work that you're doing and and what moves you um, into to today's conversation. Thanks so much, Esteban. And thanks, everyone, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so as Esteban said, my name is Lydia Palo Hobbs. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky, although I'm still located in the wonderful complex city of New Orleans, Louisiana, due to the pandemic realities of our current times. Uh, and at where I write and I teach on um, the development of the carceral state, racial capitalism, and social movements, specifically in the US South, very specifically in the case of Louisiana. Uh, and, and as Esteban also noted, I also um, am someone who has been pretty immersed in various sectors of solidarity economy for the past 
15, 18 something years now. Um, so my work has been in housing cooperatives, in limited equity um, and affordable housing cooperatives and community land trusts, and also um, in the worker cooperative movement. Um, and I had, was delighted to be a co-founder of Aorta with Esteban more than a decade ago, although I transitioned for the elusive tenure track job position uh, that I now hold um, in my life. And my work has, and I, and I say this because for years and years and years, these kind of two sectors, right? So thinking about questions of abolition, thinking about questions of mass incarceration, mass criminalization, um, the various, you know, really innovative, um, profound ways that um, criminalized and incarcerated people and their loved ones have organized and struggled to make different types of futures than kind of the ways in which um, punitive power has become so normalized in all of our lives. Um, has been really kind of siloed here and the work of solidarity economics has been over here. And for me though, if, if we think about, as I'm sure, you know, has been talked about previously, but um, is abolition, right? Which is, uh, if, if we understand that term, right, as originating um, from the organizing of black reconstruction of the work of abolition democracy as Du Bois puts it, right? Abolition is always a process of both building up new institutions and tearing institutions down. And so whenever I'm thinking about what does it actually take um, to dismantle, to disrupt um, the ways in which kind of carceral state power in all sorts of ways. So policing, jails, prison, surveillance um, have really um, intensified racism in all, all kinds of ways. And the way we, we need to get out of this is by a reorganization of our political economic system as a whole. Um, so if we're actually talking about questions of divest, invest, we have to be thinking about the ways in which we're actually scaling up our capacities uh, for economic democracy, um, for at least for me, the abolition of private property is a kind of guiding force for everything in our society and actually thinking about what does it take um, to create the types of structures that are needed in this world to actually for people to flourish. Um, and so my work is really specifically looking at uh, my scholarship, which uh, I don't want to kind of sit in that place too much, but I will say that it's been mostly in thinking about the ways in which folks have kind of the inner relationship between kind of the intensification of mass incarceration in Louisiana alongside neoliberal realignments, restructuring in Louisiana, um, and that really intensification of racism, um, anti-Black racism specifically, but also, you know, um, various types of, you know, anti-immigrant uh, racism, right, all these other different pieces coming together and the ways in which folks have organized um, to, to have profound wins, right? Uh, but something that I keep seeing in my work, right, so folks have, you know, worked to scale back policing power in instances, shift jail. Uh, sorry, I'm also being told to stop talking so fast, so I'm working on it. Thank you, beautiful interpreters. Um, so the ways in which folks have worked to, you know, scale back jailing capacity, um, fight against really draconian sentencing laws and so many other things. Um, I, I, I think that um, we have growing um, wins on this front that are important that we can be building on. But the thing that I see keep um, limiting um, kind of our possibilities is that these underlying structures of, 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 a, of a political economy that abandons large sectors of our population to misery and impoverishment um, is not actually gaining the same kind of wins, right? I would argue in some ways neoliberalism keeps going deeper. And so my question is, is if um, the best kind of abolitionist organizing has also been always been a demand of um, uh, we want less of this, but also more of this. How how is the work of solidarity economy really creating the political horizons and also the demands and the structures to actually creating the investments that allow people to have more stability and structure in their lives? Um, that maybe seems a little vague right now, um, but it's something to start with at least. So um, I thought Ade was going to jump in again, but I guess we're talking to each other. So I'll, I'll, I'll continue. I'm so yeah. happy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Do you want to say something, Ade? No, I was just affirming you. Go for it. OK. <laughs> so I'm so happy we have Lydia here because um, you articulated a whole bunch of stuff I was trying to figure out how to articulate. So thank you. <laughs> so much for already putting it out there and saying it. Um, you know, one of our questions that we have is sort of how we got into this work 
of thinking of co connecting co-ops with abolitionism. And one of the things I would say is um, I was lucky that when I was looking for a job that the um, Africana Studies Department at John Jay actually saw my work as being a, a integral to um, community-based approaches to justice. And they were actually looking for someone who could lead an innovative program uh, from the Africana Studies Department in, and if some of you don't know, but John Jay's full name is John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, and it's a very interesting um, branch of the CUNY system um, because we, we now in the 21st century are not just a police school and not just training lawyers, but see our mission as the whole uh, range of social justice issues. And my department has been pioneering looking at not just community justice or community policing, which is what most people think of as community justice, but understanding community justice actually in the ways that Lydia just said, right? That it's all about um, transforming systems of injustice uh, in some ways, even starting with looking at um, economic injustice and how do we transform it from the community level? What are the things that are happening with economic justice as well as all the other justices to create public safety or to reconfigure, re-understand public safety. So I, in some ways I got involved in this because I took that job and took on the challenge of integrating my work with cooperatives and solidarity economics with um, community-based justice and trying to understand, figuring out how to teach that and how to understand those connections. And to tell you the truth, you know, when I was uh, doing my research on African Americans and cooperatives, I was finding the ways that African Americans were actually using cooperative ownership as a liberation strategy, right? In some ways, it started out as a, a, a survival strategy, but it rapidly moved from just being a survival strategy to being a self-determination strategy to build um, institutional self-determination to then build ways for us to really liberate ourselves, again, for all the reasons that Lydia already articulated so well. But also, you know, I, um, because I teach in African American studies, right, we know that there's a whole, right, that our whole U.S. system, right, our whole policing system, our whole legal system is all based around first maintaining enslavement of African peoples, right, and then continuing to figure out ways to keep African peoples um, oppressed, right? So between enslavement and then our convict leasing system, right? Hopefully you all know that was a system that actually created a set of laws that made people who had been formerly enslaved into criminals, right? Because you could be um, incarcerated for not having a job, for uh, loitering, right? Um, et cetera, and they picked you up, put you in jail, and then they leased you out to the same people who had been the masters, who had been your masters and your overseers, and leased you out in chain gangs and stuff to do their work for them at a very reduced price paid to the state for your labor. So we, you know, we continued enslavement even after the laws say that slavery was over. And again, remember the 13th Amendment says that um, slavery is abolished everywhere except in prison, right? It says for everywhere except for those who are duly convicted of a crime. So then you create a new system of what's a crime and all those same people that you enslaved before, you now make it a crime for them to live or to make a living or to try to live, as well as you know, you leave them out of the economy and they make it a crime for any of the other things they do. And then you put them in the convict leasing system, right? And then we continue into the 20th century. We don't use the convict leasing system quite as much as we used to, but we still have all those slave labor policies that happen right within in the in prison industrial complex. And so you can see how we need to then connect the issues of economic liberation, economic justice, economic democracy with um, abolition in all its forms. <clears throat> Somebody want to jump in? Were you going to say something, Ed? No, I was going to agree with her. But that, 
I agree with her all the time, so that's nothing worth saying. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. Somebody else pointed out. Yes. Uh, I can throw in one tidbit and maybe just to keep the momentum going. Um, and it's from, uh, I've been reading The Red Deal, um, which is uh, has been put out by The Red Nation. It's also, I think last time I recommended another book from Common Notions Press. Um, and it is just so uh, poignant. It's it's a short book. I mean, it's like less. It's like less than 150 pages, and it's written at like a seventh or eighth grade reading level. So like very accessible. Maybe even sixth grade. I don't. What are reading levels? Um, I have a fifth grader. I should know this. But uh, so one one part that it that kind of um, uh, frames up and connects uh, part of what Jessica was just saying to the challenge before us is really by centering capitalism. Right, and we're here talking about racial capitalism and trying to understand that and understand how it shapes um, the the project of, of abolition. So they say, capitalism destroys life. It pollutes the rivers, it scars mountains, it starves moose, wolves, and salmon. It alienates our bonds with each other and with the earth. Its very existence demands our disappearance. The Red Nation is serious about building alternatives to the death world of capitalism that we currently endure. We're serious because we know what is at stake if we do not. As we say in the Red Deal, we have two paths, decolonization or extinction. Like the Wet'suwet'en, we are indigenous people who belong to and love our nations. Our sovereignty, our very being cannot be separated from the health and well-being of the land. Like all societies and civilizations, our relationality and the values upon which these practices are based is what makes us who we are. Our political orders and systems of governance only matter if we caretake the land. They are intelligible through our relationship with the land, literally. So just connecting that to the land acknowledgement that, that Jessica shared earlier and part of what you were just saying about um, just the role of chattel slavery in building up the apparatus of um, the U.S. economy in the first place, and of course, there's never been uh, reparations for that. And uh, I think Lydia was even starting to mention the the, the work of Reconstruction um, and uh, just that longer arc. One of the things I wanted to raise as a challenge to our thinking is um, it's pretty clear that there are many people who oppose what we're talking about um, they oppose the vision or they think they oppose the vision that we have of a world partly because um, there are a lot of people who get paid a lot of money for distorting um, the truth about the vision that we have for the world um, but I, I guess the question I'm raising is it's connected with the question of power how do we get done the things that we need done in the face of an opposition that wants to do something else or think that it wants to do something else. Like, how do we intend to deal with those people who oppose what we're trying to build? Um, do we ignore them? Um, do we just run over them? Do we seek ways to convince them of the error of their ways? And again, I, I, I wanna make a distinction between people who actually benefit from our oppression and the people who that they do um, because I think that, that one of the ways that capitalism uh, remains in power is to convince large numbers of people who are also exploited by a capitalist system that that their benefit and their privilege is best maintained by the maintenance of that system uh, even though it may be imperfect um, they will kind of run the old Maggie Thatcher approach of well there's no alternative so this is best you're going to get so if you want to hold on to your privilege, hold on to it. But I, I just want us to spend some time thinking sometime because the question of power to me is a question of getting enough people who want to do something to think alike and act in concert to get it done. And we know that there's a sizable number of people that don't want to do what we're talking about. And so the question is how do we achieve the power needed to put this into effect? And that includes the cooperative economy that we need to build it includes the abolition of uh, the existing prison system. It, it uh, includes the uh, 
destruction on the one hand, um, changing transformation of the economic system altogether. Um, and at some level, it includes um, a re-envisioning of what is the history of this country. And the last thing I want to say is that we can see that much of the current opposition that we face has taken on the role of attacking questions connected with history and truth. This whole um, wholesale attack on, on what people are calling critical race theory, whether or not it actually is, it's amusing to me because mostly people have no idea what critical race theory is. That it's just a new label that they have. And it's a label that they have largely that really means to them people saying things that I don't agree with. That, that's, that is the probably functional definition of critical race theory in a lot of people's minds. But anyhow, that attack on what is the truth and what is history is a big piece of what we're facing now. And I just want us to spend a minute thinking about how that integrates into our work moving forward. And I got a couple of ideas, but you know, um, perish the thought. The thing, yeah. I uh, want to hear your ideas, Ed. I want to hear your ideas, but I just want to jump in with with two thoughts before we hear your ideas. One of the things I try to say, you know, in all these talks I give, as well as to my students, is you know, recognizing that agency and resistance that I also tried to bring into the room with my acknowledgments. Um, because as much as I just talked about sort of the victimization that we've all suffered over these centuries, also for every victimization that we suffered, there's also a history of resilience, resistance, rebuilding, and triumph, right? And so I do, I think that also helps us. Right, because I think we knew we need to lift those up also, and we need to talk about what the triumphs, what the resistance and triumphs have been, and how we have been able to do. Right, we've been able to maintain our, our humanity. Right, we've been able um, to feed our children. We've been able to actually create some very interesting societies in the face of all this. We've been able to achieve. Some of us have been able to achieve all the stuff everybody else achieved, even with all the 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 um, what's uh, the baggage that we have right and so I do like to make sure we don't just focus on what's wrong and what's bad and whatever but also focus on the agency resilience and triumphs that we have and I think that also helps us think about abolition because abolition is so much about either people feeling like victims and so we have to protect ourselves or people feeling like there's there's no alternatives when we've already practiced alternatives throughout our histories. I agree. There have absolutely been uh, just acts of our community in the oppressed condition that we're in, where we have. Um, We've risen up, we've built things, we built things before. In fact, one of the ironies that I find about listening to some of my younger friends is almost an assumption that that courage is something that's new, that's just starting. That finally black people are courageous. They're starting to stand up. We've been courageous ever since we got drug over here. We fight every chance we had, every way we knew how. And uh, you know, it's not, it's not like you know, we got militant black folks now who are willing to fight back. Don't think those brothers and sisters in Tulsa, Oklahoma weren't willing to fight back. Um, or the ones in Elaine, Arkansas. Um, or the ones in Friars Point, Mississippi. Or, or Vicksburg, or Natchez, or Meridian. Um, or uh, uh, Eufaula, Alabama. I mean, people have been fighting back for a long time. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose when we fight back. And so my question is, like, what is the what is the, the winning strategy? Because having the courage to fight back is not the answer. It's not some new answer to an old question um, that no one's tried before. And and it's sad to me when people pretend as though they think that's it. Like we just got to stand up now and fight. It's like, yeah, we. Been, I'm in, absolutely in favor of that. I'm I'm all together in favor of that. But so were my brothers and sisters in Tulsa and Elaine, and. Um, and so now I want to win. 
And so I, I really do think that uh, a part of this question I'm raising about history is connected with the question of how to win. I don't believe that the country as a whole has spent a lot of time understanding what happened in Tulsa and Elaine um, in order to even decide what side they're on. They didn't know they had to pick sides in that issue because they hadn't heard of it. And so part of our task, our responsibility, is to make sure that there's no one who doesn't know about those things. Um, that this idea, oh, we don't want to talk about that in school because that, you know, then we can't talk about how good uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and, and Senator Bill Bow and Stennis were. And it's like, well, no, that's not, that's not what I want to talk about. Anyhow, I, I just think that, that part of our thing is like this question again of how do we assemble uh, the power needed to achieve the economic, political, social uh, gains that, that, that we need. And, um, and I, I think that part of it has to do with, with this fight that some folks are engaging with over historiography and, um, and an understanding of what the past has actually been. Right. So you, uh, some of our hosts are encouraging us to, to stay off mute and just be more conversational. Um, I'm aware that we've got two threads right now that are open and I wanna engage with both at the same time and linearly we can't do that. So I wanna come back to the question of power in just a second and shift to this history piece so we can like touch on that and then move through this power question because it's harder to resolve in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, not that history isn't contested and that's actually the point I wanna make, which is um, how part of the conditions of what we're grappling with are framed by uh, a telling of the story um, that that is uh, that comes down to oh there's nothing to see here right the whole idea of of incarceration right is removing from like the prison isn't on main street it's not in your face um they're not like live streaming it <laughs> um uh what's what's happening in the conditions um and and in fact oftentimes it's not only that they're uh located in uh, remote places, but they're busing people across state or out of state um, to places like the Angola prison where Lydia does her work. Um, and so the nothing to see here thing starts with a story and it's a contested one. I don't know where y'all land on on this, but uh, I've been I've I have been pushed just in the last year to re-examine whether or not we believe the story that the North won the Civil War. That is the story that I grew up with. That is what I was told. I was told that that's why slavery ended, right? Um, I mean, no delusion about the states' rights thing. I, whatever, grew up in New York, so that was that was off the table. But um, but we were told, like, and then the Union, like, won the war. I was not told, and here are all the states that still had enslaved people that were not affected by the 13th Amendment until later on. I was not told about the exception to the 13th Amendment, and I was not told that essentially the, um, the, the, the anxiety, the drive around maintaining the union at all costs, the costs were us, the costs were Black people, <laughs> right? So that there was a compromise that we are still living with that actually was not a uh, you have we 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 in the north have won, and that's the end of the story. Now we're going to live live into the world that we envision, which is an abolitionist world. Uh uh, it was a hmm, maybe kind of sorta we can strike a deal in order to hold this country together for economic reasons tied to um, settler colonialism and the vision of an American uh, expanding um, imperial American uh, political economy and state, um, and. Uh, and then, right. So then, the uh, that that compromise had to do everything with in in entrenching um, Southern white uh, racist uh, rule and um, exploitation, um, and uh, not only tacit but an explicit support of the Klan, um, such that it eventually spurred uh, the Great Migration ch migration and chasing Black people out of the South um, and into the West and into the North and. Um, and it has everything to do with uh, even the political and electoral landscape that we're dealing with now. There's, for some reason, still not a single state that has a majority African American population. Like, and we, before all of the white terror, 
um, we had majorities in so many places, right? And so uh, everything about the political reality we're living with of what it would mean to finish that work, what it would mean to amend a constitution, what it would mean to have actual just enfranchisement and democracy, uh, it's all um, tied to the fact that actually the North compromised the North compromise, and we're now living with the consequences of that. Um, so that for me was a shift and a hard one. And I had to read a lot of books to be like, wait, is this really what I think is happening? Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to um, think about that alongside you all and even framing the problem. Can I jump in here? Because I'm thinking a couple of different registers right now that kind of ties some of the uh, really beautiful kind of thoughts Ed kind of framed out for us. Um, and one of them is, in, and they're both kind of thinking about the ways in which um, our knowledge or, or our assumptions get siloed, right? So there's both the ways in which, um, for instance, um, our training or, or the ways in which academic training does people from like, right, pre-K all the way through whatever level of school that you attend, right? Silos all of this information, right? So we study these very narrow things that really operate to erase the connectivity that I think is so fundamental, right? So even if, if we think about what you were to say, Esteban, right? When we even think about this phrase of the North or the South, right? What we're actually talking about are the elites that are running these regions, right? Um, and, and erase all of the different kind of messy ways folks are struggling for power, are fighting for other kinds of worlds, um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, but also, I'm thinking about the ways in which even uh, to think this back to kind of uh, thinking about the ways in which um, criminalization and mass incarceration show up, right, is there is this assumption that there is something fundamentally distinct or completely um, different of what is happening in hyper-policed um, urban communities of color, right, and what is happening in completely disinvested in kind of rural communities, right, and that there's somehow it, there's something that is different there and that, that they are interlinked. Um, and so I'm thinking a lot about um, and, and forgive me if you all talked about this last time, but the work of um, that, uh, the short lived work, but I think a really important story of my friends at, and comrades at Milk Not Jails in New York State who organized for years. Um, and Milk Not Jails um, had this question, right? So if prisons, right, prisons are off, prisons and jails and detention centers are often sold to rural economic places world places that the that capital has abandoned um, as solutions, right? Um, and usually folks aren't, um, right? Those aren't the solutions that are um, going to be really um, going to be uh, proving to make anyone's lives better, right? What we know is that actually if you have a carceral facility in your location, you're probably going to have actually more unemployment, more economic instability, not greater stability. Um, but what, what does it actually mean to start actually thinking about what are the other things that could be there? And so for folks at Milk Not Jails, they understood that so much of upstate New York where prison siting has you know, um, been rampant for decades, um, there's a whole world of dairy farms, right? And so actually organizing and working with dairy cooperatives um, to actually support their kind of infrastructure and connecting them then back to places like New York City where most incarcerated people in New York State, right, are coming from and helping to organize folks um, to actually get, thank you, um, to get uh, more, um, to, to actually enter into cooperative jobs, right? Because formerly incarcerated people are strategically um, cut out of um, the labor market. And it's not an accident, right? It's not, um, it, it's part of the process because that's actually the system that, that allows people to get reincarcerated again and again and again and again, right? Is this very kind of criminalization of economic survival strategies that formerly incarcerated people are given access to. So then how are we thinking about these types of relationships as, as the fundamental work of kind of anti-racist economic organizing that sees uh, kind of the work of cooperatives um, in two really different kind of places, right? Places that we are made to think are totally separate from each other. We can actually start to see those relationships because racial capital is so good at seeing those relationships. And I think on our side, it's often much harder to actually see them or articulate them and start to organize in ways that cross these kind of lines um, to get at this question of power, um, that we start to see the relationships in unlikely places that allow us to organize in new and different ways. Yeah, to move into the power question, and thanks for bringing that, yeah, to bring that together so well. I. You know, and maybe I'm naive, but I honestly don't see any other way to build power but but the, 
from the bottom up from like local grassroots practices that build on each other and continue to build up, bubble up and up and up. And so I really think we, we all as abolitionists, or even if we don't see ourselves as abolitionists, if we just care about humanity, um, we need to recognize that we just have to, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we have to start to practice these values, right? Of non-exploitation, collectivism, solidarity, um, prosperity for all, economic uh, democracy, right? Whatever we do, whether it's in our little family unit, whether it's in the daycare center our children go to, whether it's where we shop, whether it's um, how we bank, whether you know, whether it's wh where we live, right? We need to try to figure out how and when can we practice, do these everyday solidarities that bring us closer to creating the kind of economy, broader economy that we want to live in. And to me, the more we practice it, the more we demand it in, in the places where we can, that builds power because it helps to stabilize us. It helps to show ourselves as well as other people how how this works and how it can, you know, how, how to make it work. And it also strengthens us because every time we do it, we practice it, we start to do something, we get better and better at it. We figure out how it can, how we can make it into more places in our lives, how we can do more of it, how we can connect to other people who are doing it. And um, so that would be my one real message. We just have to keep practicing this stuff and try to demand it in every space that we can. Um, and one, you know, I just was reading something today about, you know, police in schools. And that's to me, in some ways, a simple place to start, right? We need to demand that the police get out of our schools. There are lots of ways that we can handle discipline if this if discipline is an issue. And most of the time discipline isn't an issue is because we're not doing developmentally appropriate educational pedagogy with the children, right? Um, but the first thing is, right, demand that the police not be in your child's school. And then you can talk to people about what else can we do? I mean, I, we used to have safety patrols. What happened to safety patrols? Where you know, just the stupid stuff. If somebody threw garbage on the ground, the safety patrol had the other kid pick it up, right? So that's peer stuff. And then, as I said, the, the real discipline is about thinking about what's educationally appropriate for what age the person is, and right, and engaging them educationally and engaging them socially at their level. And that is all we need to do in schools for discipline. Um, so, right, again, I'm just saying start simply, but that's a huge simple thing to do if you think about it because that whole school to prison pipeline right is just so insidious um that if we could just stop things right there we're doing we're, we're doing a huge thing but it's a simple thing for us as parents to say that's the first place we're going to intervene or even before doing at home trying to figure out conflict transformation with our within our families with our kids and with our kids and their children right so that people learn that right if there's a way to handle conflict, it doesn't conflict doesn't have to be a whole violent, horrible contest of wills, right? It can be a way to get to a better point or better ideas, right? We could even start there and then from there move to fixing our schools in terms of discipline, that kind of thing. But the point is to take power where we can and as we can and to keep moving it forward. Yeah. Uh I feel you and I I agree with everything that you just said, Jessica. I I, I want to make sure that we are grappling with um, some of the dilemmas that don't have as clear of a direction or a position uh, where I don't think the left has actually figured out our position. And so I want to dig into um, uh, following along all of this conversation about power that we actually do need to talk about the state, um, especially if we're talking about racial capitalism. It can't just be about like, um uh some some of our, our our visions of a change in behavior at different scales or at different sites like i'm seeing conversations about the grocery store in the chat or at schools um but that we actually need to to figure out like what is our relationship to the state and um this is one of the dilemmas that we've been thinking about um inside of aorta in, in some of our internal praxis and political education and um and 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 conversations about that um, and just learning about the ways in which there's this, um, what is it? There's this, uh, the, these we find ourselves situated between these two poles, one of which is a kind of anarchist, 
uh, anti-statist, like just ignore the state completely, disengage from it. And maybe if we drop out and whatever, whether it's back to the land or form a commune, create our own bubble utopia and everything will be okay. That is leaving so many people behind and it doesn't uh, actually deal with the harm and the repair that needs to happen um, for black and indigenous communities, especially, um, but also all working class, poor people, basically the 99% and everyone, let alone the repair we have for the climate as a whole. If we just unplug, we're all gonna get cooked, right? So we actually need Need to deal grapple with these questions um and which is not to say i mean if i'm sure that there are anarchists here on the call um that's that's fine I, I still think that we need to grapple with these questions um right and so then on the other extreme you have these i guess liberals or maybe some of the progressive people who are like the state will save us all we need to do is like have one great election and uh or 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 hire in and 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 appoint all of the wonks who like know the best technocratic solutions um and everything will be okay and obviously we know that the, the answer lies somewhere in between um that there's a way in which we need to engage the state but not have uh uh, uh baseless faith in um in the state being some sort of like a, a savior for us um and actually having a very healthy distrust of the state um and its ability its ability and its incentives for actually addressing the needs that we have um including at the scale we're talking about obviously there's a bunch of stuff that i, I think is below the radar of the state and it's appropriate whether it's from a socialist or an anarchist or whatever kind of perspective um i think it's appropriate that we build up our own um, counter institutions and that we uh, that when we talk about things like at the level of community policing and stuff like that, like that there are ways in which, you know, what I was saying earlier about my work with Philly stands up as an example of that. It was operating at such a small scale that the state was irrelevant. It was really easy to disengage from the state, from courts, policing, cops. Um, I know that there's a question about uh, lawyers and how they figure into all of this. Um, and, uh, and we'll probably get to that in the Q&A later. Uh, but those are questions that I think we need to grapple with. Those are dilemmas that we need to navigate as we're envisioning ab abolitionist world. It can't just be utopian um, and, uh, and, and theoretical that we actually need to grapple with um, um, some of the strategy about what's our relationship to the state if we are thinking about decarceration abolition i mean i'm you know zooming in from philadelphia where uh we kicked off that wave i mean it was literally just like my friends and i my neighbors um uh who in the democratic primary in 2016 um somehow got larry krasner through um as a really progressive da and it's interesting to me that here we are whatever five years later and he almost seems like a center left compared to some of the other actually much more radical district attorneys who have been successfully elected by movements. And so even to the extent that we could be disappointed and dispirited and skeptical of the moments where we have proximity or access to power, like progressive voices, the squad or whatever, um, maybe a progressive mayor um, or other elected officials, uh, that, uh, that, yeah, that we just are still maintaining um, uh some some strategy about what it is that we do when we do have access to power um and uh and remembering that you know even if we have whatever uh we we got rid of the fascist the impending sort of fascist regime um and we're disappointed with the neoliberal center whatever not even center left I, honestly center right uh biden administration um it doesn't mean that we should be turned off from all government and all of all political organizing right that it is that's happening concurrent with um this wave of uh progressive um uh, electoral work happening specifically around a campaign of decarceration so those are some of the tensions um that that i'm thinking through and just want to invite into the conversation as well can i jump in here a little bit also off of ed's uh chat which is that we should control the state um because I also think that the state is not just some static thing, right? The state is made and remade and remade in so many different capacities. Um, and one of the things that I grapple with is someone who has only ever lived, I am 36 years old, so I have only ever lived under neoliberalism. And so that has been the state structure I have only known. Um, and I am no, um, I do not romanticize the New Deal era, right? But like there is something deep to me about what it means that we normalize the current US state as the only option, right? Um, 
without understanding the like profound struggle that happens not just against the state, but within the state as fundamentally an institution of institutions, right? Um, and so of course, right now is terrible in so many ways, right? Like I keep thinking it was announced, I don't know, today or yesterday, or in the last couple of days, right? That the Biden administration's like new anti-terrorism and response to the uh, January 6th attacks, right? Includes anti-capitalists, right? And anti-authoritarians as terrorists, right? Like um, in under that kind of banner. Unsurprising, unsurprising, terrible, unsurprising, right? Um, but they know what they're criminalizing on purpose, right? These are not, um, they're not dumb. I think we, we lose, and I, and I would have said that also about the Trump administration. They're not dumb people. We have profoundly different values, but that, that does not make them idiots. But I keep thinking about what does it mean that we want the state to invest in, right? Um, and I keep thinking about, and then what is the scale at which we can make that happen? So um, I will share a very personal thing. Um, which is that, so my partner is a musician, um, so who um, obviously has been mostly deeply unemployed, right, for the entirety of the pandemic. Uh, he plays a horn, right? So you, you can't, you can literally not wear, uh, wear a mask and play a saxophone. Um, and there's an incredible uh, music com like organization in New Orleans that like works for like the benefit of uh, musicians and cultural workers. And they spend so much time um, giving out, doing mutual aid fundraising, giving small grants out, like a couple hundred bucks to musicians. Really important work. And also, it was in the last weeks of the Paycheck Protection Program that a bunch of musicians on their own figured out that they could be getting like $10,000, $20,000 actually through that. And there was this moment we were like, why aren't we organizing webinars to teach musicians how to do this paperwork and get the dollars the state is offering them that is will be such a more significant lift right it will like save people's lives in ways that like i love grassroots fundraising i believe mutual aid is a beautiful building block of society but i would rather take the dollars that are from rich people's taxes to pay uh unemployed musicians right than than uh, like our small communities of people circulating dollars in small amounts over and over and over again right so we need to do also, both like, how do we see those pieces what do you say we need to do both we need to do both, right? But how do we not um, orient in one way that uh, erases certain things? And then, and then you know, we might be beholden if we don't also keep the capacities of collective organizing right. um, alive and building those and expanding those. So we're, we're, you know, we're really prefiguring the types of worlds that we want to live in. But so for me, I'm always like, how are we holding both of this um, in, in, in all these messy questions? So thank you so much for raising this. I think part of it is also about building infrastructure, which is a lot of the work that Ed does, actually, um, and the work that, you know, that um, that that the Worker Call Federation is is doing, like, even just with that example, and I appreciate the, the concrete examples, I, I sometimes the conversations when the questions and the problems are so big, we tend to like, rise up like hot air into the ethereal, but to be like, boom, what about what happened in 2020 with the payroll protection program is really concrete. And I think it, it illustrates a lot. Um, I just was in a NCBA board meeting. That's the National Cooperative Business Association, um, which uh, I'm, I've, I've been on the board of for, for about a decade now. Um, and we were hearing that it was like, oh, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but like billions of dollars that flowed into cooperatives from the, the, P, the payroll protection program um, and the economic injury and disaster loan program, which by the way, we were not going to be eligible for as consumer cooperatives and worker cooperatives. It was literally because we had built, and thank you, Geo, thank you, Jessica, uh, for being some of the founders um, of the USFWC um, to enable us to even exist, right? So we were founded just in 2004. It meant that in March of 2021, I'm sorry, last year, 2020, uh, we were working with our cooperative coalitions to make sure, even though we've been working on this for decades, but to make sure that that crisis wasn't wasted, that we use it as an opportunity to say, SBA, get your shit together. And even if you're not willing to waive this rule, um, uh, giving us access to the 7A loan programs forever, they at least were able to loosen it and open it up a little bit because the economy was going off a cliff to say, okay, actually millions of people are going to be affected, uh, the workforce, small businesses, et cetera. So maybe we'll make an exception. If you're bar, you little co-op people, if you're borrowing under $200,000, that's fine. You can use this whole program. And overnight, what would have taken 50 years of organizing to have that amount of capital infused into our, our, our ecosystem, um, that, that that change happened. 
Um, and I saw this in both of my workplaces that our staffs were either stabilized or able to grow, right? And so we, at, to your point, Lydia, we absolutely can't shy. Why leave money on the table? Capitalism, the 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 ruling classes, they've got a vacuum just hovering over every last little morsel of resources. So uh, we got to go elbows out. Um, those of you who grew up in larger families with siblings, like you know what it's like if you snooze, like it's just there's little scraps of food left on the table you got to get in there so uh it's i think similar when when we're such a small fry in this large um uh ecosystem of uh of of businesses and and other uh folks who are leaning on on the government in a lot of different ways break a day or abe are you coming with the break oh, yeah. oh, I, I wanted to see if ed had a last thing to say before we go oh, to break Go. Yes. You know, um, you know, I, I, I just noticed in, in the notes uh, a note about abolishing the capital state and establishing a worker state, and um, you know, the the mechanisms of that are, are very interesting to me. Do we let everybody vote? Um, uh, are, are there working people who would vote to do the wrong thing still, um, and or do we just? Uh, create some controls on who votes, much like they're working on doing now, um, to, to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. These are not simple questions, they, um, and 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 our our rhetoric, short phrases about it, don't answer the deep and, and complex mechanisms of what it really requires to to do that. And I just hope that that we stay in conversation. That has to happen. The, the deep and long and complicated conversation that, that can't be replaced by by short phrases and labels and titles and uh, and invectives from the 19th century. I can get in trouble for that, so I, I said it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's all right. I so as we head into a break before the Q and A. Please put your Q and your questions in the Q and A section so we can prepare for that. And we're about to move into a wonderful performance by Jay Reed. I'm really excited um, to introduce um, Jay Reed. He's a he's a friend and a local musician here. I'm in East Orange. I come to um, his people's open mic night, um, and um, I think you're all going to be very I'm happy to, that he's part of this program. Um, Jay, are you ready? How you doing? You hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, how you doing, Abe? Hey, yeah, well, appreciate that. Um, yeah, so um, like you said, my name is Jay Reed. Um, I'm originally from uh, North New Jersey, still here. Um, yeah, so I know Abe just through the community. I run a, um, well, I help to uh, run an open mic. It's called People's Open Mic, um, mostly because it was started by the people, um, for the people. So it was started, it was originally just a, a collective of, of like-minded um, artists, writers, students, teachers, and, and just people in the community who um, just wanted to share their gifts or, you know, have discussions or whatnot. And um, um, eventually, uh, you know, it, it became, it became uh, something more than just a, a, a meeting. You know, people kind of wanted to, uh, to to hold on to the platform as a way to uh, to express themselves and just, you know, it was really like church for the artists. If, if any of y'all are uh, familiar with, you know, uh, regular open mics. Um, it's the longest running open mic in the state of New Jersey, which I'm very proud of. And we're actually going to be having an event next Wednesday. I'm just going to be the first in-house event um, after COVID happens. And um, yeah, uh, Gallery of Pharaoh. Um, I'm sure Abe can uh, give you all the information. He very, uh, you know, he frequents a lot. You know, um, and um, he also shares. I don't know why he, you know, he could give us all too. But um, yeah, I'm gonna give y'all um, some just some good music. I, I do wanna say, uh, yeah, y'all are having a lot, of, a lot of heavy conversations that, that, um, that you know, definitely could be had. And, um, you know, it sounds like y'all are, are doing the work, you know, I'm not familiar so much with, with the organization, but um, from, from what I hear, um, yeah, y'all, um, yeah, I'm proud to be a part of this conversation, so. Thank you. 
Ooh, y'all might be familiar with that. I'm very sweaty right now. But um, that was um, Vivaldi's summer. Um, third movement. Um, I think it's like the first or second day of summer. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure. And um, I'm going to sing a little song. Uh, yeah, hopefully my uh, music can bring a little light in the conversation as well. I heard y'all talk mentioning the musicians, which was a dope thing. I definitely could have used that webinar, but uh, and I'm, I'm teasing. But this song is called "Can't Nobody." It's a song I wrote um, personifying my violin. Ain't nobody touch me like you. And won't nobody trust me like you. Don't nobody love me like you. You're hoping beneath my wing. The reason why I sing, girl, won't nobody touch me like you. And won't nobody trust me like you. Don't nobody love me like you. You're hoping beneath my wing. The reason why I sing, girl, I got to hear you, baby. I need to feel you too. The only one to know just how to get me in the mood. Cause you're my single lady, down to the interlude. You taught me patience, but I can't wait to get to you. Some may say that I'm crazy, but in time, the world is sure to see that you and I were meant to be. When love is hard to find, so probably call you mine. And through whatever we'll forever sing together, baby. Can't nobody judge me like you do, no. And baby, you're the rhythm to my blues. I just want to say, nobody love me like you do, no. You're the wind beneath my wings. The reason why I sing, girl, nobody does me like you do, no. Baby, you're the rhythm to my blues. I just want to say, nobody love me like you do, no. You're the wind beneath my wings. The reason why I sing, girl, remember when I met you. The heart is set you down. It showed you off to all my friends when they would come around. We were a sight to see. It helped me break the mold. And once I learned your body, I got to touch it so someone understand. And when you are in my hand, my heart's at ease and then the world is making sense again. When I'm in need of love, you always feel me up. So they're sweating too, sweating all, oh, baby. Nobody does me like you do, no. Baby, you're the rhythm to my blues. I just want to say, nobody love me like you do, no. You're a wind beneath my wing. The reason why I want more time is because nobody loves me like you do, no. And baby, you're the rhythm to my blues. I just want to say, nobody love me like you do, no. You're a wind beneath my wings. The reason why I see it, girl. We are twin love. It feel like divine love. In spite of rhyme, if that was a time, I would do time love. But we were lock and swallow the key. Praise the God for you, hollow would be. Love the way that you sing. If I had a ring, I would have got on a knee. I would have been your light so bright you might provoke the sun. In this world, nobody's perfect, but girl, know you the closest one. High above the rest. Plus, you keep me at my best. When this road gets rough and rocky, ain't no problem. No, you got me, mommy. Ain't nobody. Touch me like ya, and won't nobody trust me like ya. Nobody love me like ya. You're a wind beneath my wing. The reason why I sing, girl, nobody loves me like you do. Oh, baby, you're the rhythm to my blues. I just wanna say, nobody love me like you do. No, you're a wind beneath my wing. The reason why I sing, girl. <laughs> Yeah. So um I'm gonna give you all one second because I'm gonna um just wipe my face off. I'm a little sweaty. One more quick excerpt, and I'm gonna let y'all have y'all y'all space back. Wow.
next Wednesday. Jay Reed, once again, appreciate your time and attention. Um, yeah, I'm like sweating because I had to turn the, the, the fan off just because I didn't want it buzzing in the back. But um, yeah, appreciate y'all um, having me. And um, yeah, thanks, Abe. Hopefully I'll see you next week. And um, yeah, a couple more folks. Yeah, y'all be blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Reed. Yes. Give it up, everyone. Definitely show some love in the chat. You can go off mute, do some live celebration around that music. Thank you so much for your offering. Do you have a Venmo handle or something where we can show you some love with some tips? Yes, or? yes, yes. Oh this yeah, is- most, most, most definitely. Um, my Venmo handle is J. The letter read, like read a book, J-R-E-A-D, the Grim, like the Grim Reaper. So J Reed the Grim. Um, that's my uh my Venmo. Um and Cash App, it's my uh same Zell, that's everything. Can you um, put that in the chat? Oh, there we go. Someone put it. I don't know Beautiful. if you can um take a picture of that or not, but um yeah. So um and, and if not, yeah, I don't know Abe got all my information. But yeah, like I said, appreciate y'all, man. Y'all keep doing the good work. Thank you. Wow. Ain't nobody. Such a nice rhythm. Um, mm. So we are nearing the end of this full voluptuous conversation, Co-ops Not Cops, part two. Um, And I hope that the conversation has been um, stimulating and and intriguing. <laughs> I'm looking for like all the adjectives right now, but I'm like still in the music, but I hope you've been enjoying. So we are gonna move into the Q and A part. And um, so this is your time to kind of put your questions in the Q and A session. I'm gonna put folks back on spotlight. It looked like you were about to say something, Esteban. Yeah, I was, I. I was sort of looking at the questions as we went along and um, I was going to jump into those. Oh, lovely. Yes. Yes. If I guess you, y'all can see the question. So go for it. So there was a question about book recommendations and I wanted to do a couple of things. I I know y'all, I know y'all have book recommendations. Um, So uh, I was going to read a paragraph from this. Um, by way of recommendation. Um, this just came out on AK Press, which is a worker cooperative. All, basically all the books I'm recommending were published by worker co-ops and the book jackets were usually designed. Uh, this one by Just Seeds, which is a working worker co-op um, that does posters and a lot of book jackets, especially for, uh, for Common Notions and some of the Verso books. Um, so this is my first rec. It is called We Will Not Cancel Us. It is by Adrienne Marie Brown. It is even shorter than The Red Deal. Um, And it gets into not these big macro, macro questions, but really, well, yes, big questions, Uh, but not the the infrastructure institutional scale. It gets at the small scale, which is about relationships. How are we navigating? uh, How how are we building out culture from within our movements that uh, makes it possible to live in an abolitionist world where we are not, we're not sort of removing people. Um, And so the one paragraph that I wanted to read goes like this. Uh, The instances of visible dissonance, harm and abuse in movement are evidence of toxicity in our intersecting systems of identity, belonging, resource, power and home. One toxic substance is supremacy so ubiquitous that it has long been invisible to those benefiting from it and can seem desirable to those suffering from it. It manifests as white supremacy, male supremacy, ableist supremacy, straight supremacy, cis supremacy, and more. The belief that some of us are normal, are better, are justified to take and do whatever we want, including harm each other and the earth. We won't end the systemic patterns of harm by isolating and picking off individuals just as we can't limit the communicative power of mycelium, those are like underground mushroom networks, by plucking a single mushroom from the dirt. 
we need to flood the entire system with life affirming principles and practices to clear the channels between us of the toxicity of supremacy, to heal from the harms of a legacy of, of devaluing some lives and needs in order to indulge others, uh, which goes directly to what Lydia was saying earlier. So that's uh, We Will Not Cancel Us by Adrian Marie Brown on AK Press. I already wrecked The Red Deal. Um, by the Red Nation, the it says uh, the subtitle is Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth. Um, I have this is my like re reading rainbow fantasy. Where did I just put the Mariam Kaba book? It was just sitting here. Oh, uh, we do this till we free us by Mariam Kaba. Everyone that we've been talking about is um, cited, quoted, or contributes um, to some section of either this book or the other ones. Um, from the first panel or this one. Um, and and this is uh, this one is on Haymarket. <laughs> and lastly, um, I recommended this one last time, but for those of you who weren't in that uh, conversation, this one is called Making Abolitionist Worlds um, on Common Notions Press, commonnotions.org is where you find it. Um, centering and amplifying the, the struggles of incarcerated people who are actively working to transform prisons from the inside. Um, and that's part of what happens here. So it, this is uh, edited and it's got contributions from everyone I look up to. That's my answer. Also, someone's asking where to buy besides Amazon. Um, I just wanna do a shout out. It's fantastic when you can, if you know publisher to buy directly for them, right? So a place like Common Notions or Haymarket has a website, you can buy them directly from there. Um, if that isn't working for you for some other reason, there's an incredible resource out there called bookshop.org, which is a, a website that you can buy. It's all like independent bookstores and it like amalgamates them. So you can find books through them. Money goes back into small businesses, right? It's a really great Amazon alternative. And in my experience, they've always shown up just as fast as an Amazon book has. Yeah. With none of the grossness behind it. So um, that's a really great resource for folks. We have a post right now that's sort of pushing back on Amazon Prime Day um, for at the Worker Co-op Federation. So you can, we have a thing that's hashtag shop co-op um, and it includes a lot of the worker cooperative bookstores. We also have a map where you can look up um, worker co-ops by industry. And so it filters out like Where's the nearest, or maybe not even nearest, because all of the worker co-op bookshops will ship to you. Um, so that's another way um, of doing that. I think for folks zooming in from other parts of Turtle Island up in Canada, um, there are similar resources up there. Um, uh, it's a similar kind of uh, uh, the organized under the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation, CWCF. Mm -hmm. I just want to also recommend your local library should have these books. So you can always make book requests that they buy, you know, copies in bulk um, so that, you know, you can read them, share them with the rest of your community. So check out your local library as well. Did folks want to get into the other questions? Go ahead, Lydia. Uh, let me just do a real quick. Uh, oh, yeah. Jessica shouted out um, Angela Davis's, you know, indispensable, our prison's obsolete in the chat. That's obviously great. And then Esteban shout out many things that I was gonna shout out. Um, but something else I would like to call people's attention to is there's this great magazine out there called, and I always pronounce it wrong, The Funambulist. And it's kind of, uh, it's a global magazine about struggles happening across the world. They've done special issues on abolition across the world because right, it's not just a US story. This is a broad based conversation and the various ways people are struggling against global capital um, all over and it's incredible. And they recently made all past issues um, available for free online. So it's just a great resource for short um, pieces that I learn a lot about things happening in places I would not know about otherwise. Oh, you also had some other recommendations for me, Lydia, when I asked you this privately, like a year ago, uh, you recommended Policing the Planet. Oh, yes, Policing uh, the Planet, um, edited by Christina Heatherton and Jordan Camp, um, which is a verso plant, not Policing the Planet, Policing the Planet, um, by Heather, by Camp and Heatherton. Um, it's a verso book. Um, I also think people are trying to understand some longer histories. This is where I'm, you know, a real... 
I'm sorry, I'm a professor, but I really think Black Reconstruction is a book that we can go back to a million times. Yes. And we should go back to, and reading groups around it are phenomenal. And it, I mean, it, you know, I think it is one of the most profound things we can learn. Um, and then there's um, kind of attached to like that kind of era of history um, is Dave Rodiger's book. So I'm going to forget the title. Um, Seizing Freedom. Seizing Freedom is this really readable book. Um, it's called Slave Emancipation and Liberation for All. And it really does this beautiful way of talking about organizing, you know, um, you know, the, the general strike of enslaved people, right, who and the Civil War, right, not, not Lincoln, um, in so many ways. And how that also spurs labor organizing and feminist organizing and how do we actually understand all of these things related. Um, and yes, Black Reconstruction by Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, uh, big, nice white copy. Uh, black lettering, you know, is just one of the best. And things. I recommended this last time, but it's called Beyond Survival. Um, and it's kind of a, a one of the toolkits, the many toolkits that are emerging these days around how to um, address alternatives to policing, specifically around transformative justice and ways of addressing harm without relying on the state. And again, we're saying this alongside some of the conversations and strategies for dealing with the state. So some of the work that I've done is, is in here. I contributed a chapter about Philly Stands Up. Um, this is on AK Press as well. And it says um, stories and strategies from the transformative justice movement. All right, more questions. There's a ton of them. I'm glad to read some of them out. Would that be helpful? Because they're kind of long. Um, so let's start with this first one. What do you think are the reasons that other cooperatives may not engage with abolition? What do you think prevents them from engaging in this common cause? And in an effort to try and get to um, as many of these questions, if you could give your initial thoughts, and it seems like a lot of these connect together. Well, on that one, um, I'll jump in and say, I think <laughs> uh, Jessica and Ed probably have more to say about this than I do, but I think in the case of agricultural co-ops, um, they were abolitionists and then they were all attacked by the Klan and chased off the land and the government, in fact, is uh, in some instances has had to pay settlements. Um, and this is a lot of the work that the Federation of Southern Co-ops has done, the, the true federation, <laughs> our heroes um, who, who are organizing Black farmers in the South through cooperative forms. Um, and I think in, in for, for other groups, um, some of it is a, maybe like a marketing. I think a lot of it is actually the legacy of McCarthyism and the ways in which cooperation it has been stigmatized, right? Um, through the Red Scare. And, um, and so there was this turn to not abandon cooperative models, but to depoliticize them and to sanitize them, to scrub the word co-op off of it. Now, thankfully, because of all the organizing that you all and our bro broader movements are doing, co-ops are back in vogue. And so you see REI sticking co-op co back on their logo after decades of ignoring it. Um, and so I think that's part of the work is like, how do we make it um, more... Uh, because these are their incentives, right? Cooperatives are businesses. So if the market incentive is you're going to lose sales and your business is not going to become viable if you are uh, brand, you know, branding yourself as uh, part of a revolutionary anti-capitalist model, then uh, a lot of traditional cooperatives, producer and consumer co-ops and marketing co-ops will distance themselves from it. Um, and we're not going to see that change from groups like Ocean Spray or Lando Lakes. They're just, that's what they do. Um, there are some that that we might see start to um, uh, push push that uh, model a little more like nationwide co-op and some of the credit unions are doing this and they're actually getting really vocal about um, anti-black racism. I mean, they, they use the language of diversity and equity and inclusion, but they're they're serious and they're taking a lot of um, steps around um, really serving the black community and addressing um, uh, police violence. So that's heartening and, and, and interesting. I think for worker co-ops, um, uh, maybe we're the, maybe in some ways like the most explicitly um, abolitionist, but it really, it's, 
uh, we live in a very like libertarian country, um, including libertarian left and, and a lot of anarchist tendencies. So there's no like, this is the program, this is how our sector, we don't move in alignment the way that 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 worker cops in other parts of the world do. So I think it's gonna, you're still, you're always gonna find this diversity for better or for worse of groups who are explicitly political um, and, and some who are, are not. Um, and uh, that's, that's part of the work of organizing. I think the last thing I would say is, um, this is one of the reasons why we need to center uh, multiracial organizing um, and some of the political education. Uh, I actually see even problematic co-ops as a great site of organizing because these are organized groups who have a set of shared assets and economic power. Work with it. They're already organized. <laughs> so uh, there, there is opportunity there. I mean, obviously, if there are groups who are explicitly um, not down with our values, then don't waste your time. Uh, but certainly for co many cooperative groups, they're, they're willing to be to be moved along. Um, so so why not? There's there's something that's kind of connected to this. And then again, it's not exactly connected to this, but I want to say it anyway. I don't know how many people on this call know about the resettlement authority that was organized by as part of the New Deal in, in, uh, in about 1935. Um, um, and disbanded shortly thereafter. But one of the things it did was, it was the first time they actually, the federal government moved on this question of 40 acres and, and, some, and some farm equipment. And um, they set up resettlement camps where they gave people 40 acres of land, um, access to a tractor, a house that was built for them, a chicken coop. Um, they built a co-op on that land to, rather than where, uh, Sharecroppers had to go to the company store, the commissary, and end up always owing just more money than, than they produced. These were co-ops that were run and controlled for provisioning them, as well as making sure they had access to the equipment and seed and stuff that they needed. This program was abandoned two years later. So there was one set up not very far from where I live now, and I ran into it by accident. And I had asked Jessica, and it wasn't something that she'd seen a lot about either. Um, one in, in Lakeview, Arkansas, that actually had 90 families that had were given 40 acres of land apiece, black families. Uh, this program was abandoned because uh, Southern uh, senators and stuff accused it of being an attempt at the Bolshevik collectivization of agriculture in the United States. Um, just to let you know how insidious this anti-communist uh, motion was, um, and this is, again was the 1930s, this preceded Joe McCarthy's uh, stuff in particular, but it, it shows how deeply the fear of working people organizing, working together and doing things for themselves was. So the program that worked as effectively, nothing was wrong with these people having 40 acres of equipment and they were allowed to buy the farm on a long-term 30, 30 year mortgage for $5,000 you know, which transforms some families from being very, very poor to uh, being in the middle class as landowners um, as part of a co-op. So this is part of the history that doesn't get talked about very much because um, for any number of reasons, there are people who would rather notice this or claim that it has no significance. I think it has great significance because again, as an existence proof of what is possible and the different ways that we can approach things, that, uh, that it's an important example that we all need to know more about, you know, even as we continue to do our work and, um, and share other examples and build other concrete examples of the kind of world that we'd like to see. But if you ever get a chance, go to Lakeview, Arkansas, not the one in the northern part of the state, but the one in the eastern part of Arkansas near, near Helena and, uh, and Elaine, it's in between Helen and Elaine, Arkansas. Thank you for that history, Ed. Um, there's a couple other questions here, so I'll do my best to get to as many. And of course, if you feel moved to respond to one in particular, panelists, please do. This one was mentioned earlier in the talk around um, any solutions or radical ideas around how to change the court systems. Um, if this person is still on the call, you're free to unmute yourself and ask your question, but related to kind of anti-racism, justice, how that intersects with the court system and abolition work, um, 
and co-ops. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, Lydia, I thought you were going to say something. Oh, I was just reading the question because I was oh. making sure that I <laughs> made, I understood it. Um, okay. Do you have something to say, Jessica, though? Okay. Not um, really. Go ahead. Um, so I'll start because I think what you're sharing is a real uh, is a real is a real issue, um, and I'm like, and I'm I'm truly sorry that you are dealing with this reality because it is, um, you know, I don't have to tell you that it's um, financially and econo financially economically emotionally um, draining in all of the ways, um, and I think that. Um, part of what this um, question says is names the reality, right? That we, um, right? We live in a world where both district attorneys, right? So prosecutors get unbelievable amount of resources in direct comparison to, right? Our public defense system in this country um, that which leads public defenders to be under overworked, underpaid, unable to do their best job in many cases, even if people want to do better. And um, leading many people is very common, right, for people to then go to the kind of the private legal defense sphere, which is enormously costly, right? Um, and, and because of how the court is set up, unless you are working with, you know, there are beautiful abolitionist, um, anti-jail, anti anti-police criminal defense attorneys and public and private entities working, right? But many folks, right, see themselves as two sides of this thing, this, this idea of balance in the criminal justice system, right? We're just both working on each of our sides. Um, and I think that this is the question that I don't have any concrete advice, um, right? But I think that there, there's this question about how do we reduce prosecutorial power in all of these ways that allow for folks to be caught in the court system over and over again. Um, and, and I say this as someone who has learned a lot. From, so Miriam Kaba who Esteban shouted out her book, We Do This Till We Free Us, um, who's co-founder of many organizations, including um, Survived and Punished, which works with um, criminalized um, survivors of sexualized violence. And one of the things they actually did was they went from organizing around uh, prosecutorial, um, prosecutorial accountability to anti-prosecution because they realized that the if accountability is actually a question of undoing harm the only way to actually undo harm was to actually by working to undo prosecution as a body in itself and i think this is the thing too where um the larry krasner case in philly actually reveals the contradiction right if both krasner's uh, win is important and his re-election is important we also can see after a, a stint um, the fundamental limitations of an office um, that is, despite the language that we hear in a courtroom, right, which is uh, prosecutors as the people serve nothing close to the people, right, serve capital in all of its ways. And so I guess this is me abstracting, and I'm sorry, I think that the, the difficulty is that um, we should not have the court process as currently arranged, right, it's arranged um, to um, to hurt, right, uh, the process is a punishment in and of itself, and we need to start realizing that um, as a broader space, I don't have any more specific suggestions um, at the individual scale other than this is terrible. Um, and I and I don't know totally, you know, I don't know if lawyers or ways to work with the court system where you are, but those are some initial thoughts. Yeah, I don't really have anything better to say, but I just wanted to throw out um, that, you know, there are some interesting experiments with community courts. Um, which I don't know how we could connect the co-op and solidarity movements with them, but the, there should be some way that we could do that. But I'm also thinking about even um, community uh, co-op law firms. I know there's a group, uh, the um, uh, Black Prisoners Caucus in Washington State has been toying with if they were ever allowed to actually form a worker co-op in prison, which some other countries do allow. They were thinking about one of the co-ops that they would form would be uh, at least a, a paralegal, because I'm not sure any of them are actually practicing lawyers, but at least a paralegal worker co-op, because there's so much that they have learned on their own about the legal system and about defense and all that kind of stuff that they were thinking they could offer those services to other people. Um, wow. So I do think we could, right, if we think out of the box, I mean, it doesn't really solve the litigation issue. It doesn't solve the prosecutorial issue, 
but it is another form, you know, when people ask me, you know, what are the major forms of worker co-ops? I say one of the things I love about the model is how flexible it is, right? Between sex workers, medical personnel, um, quilters, whatever, right? Anybody can really be a worker co-op, any industry, any occupation. And so we should think about whether, you know, between lawyers, um, I also think we should be have we should have local neighborhood watches that are co-op, right? That are worker co-op security centers, things like that. I really think we need to think out of the box in terms of how can we run and own some of these, if we have to have them or on the road to real abolition, if we have to have some of these occupations and professions, shouldn't we own them together? Shouldn't the workers own them? How could we do that on the road to real abolition? Ooh, principal disagreement. I okay. actually think that some of the neighborhood, uh, the community policing stuff seems really important to me to not monetize it, to not turn it into a job or a professional thing, to not tie it to any sort of uh, profit uh, motive, even if it's not profit maximizing and capitalist, um, that actually like having it be uh, not a worker co-op seems important. And I found this through my work with Philly Stands Up, which is um, it felt really important and maybe one of the reasons why we lasted so long in doing the work that it wasn't, it wasn't work. It wasn't monetized. It was mm -hmm. like, y'all can't pay me to do this work. This work sucks. It's hard. Okay. And yeah. so it was That's really a good like, point. and, and actually Miriam Kaba talks about this also. Like when we, a lot of times when we do transformative justice work, we don't take money for it because it's mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. the rate I would need to charge. It just is like, no, never mind. I'm doing this from a different place. Like you can do a like mutual aid barter thing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, there is something that I want to like shift about how we're imagining it. I think that there's co-ops that could be embedded in other things like uh, the after school programs and the tutors and the like, like the recreation centers and taking kids to soccer leagues and splash parks and whatever. But, uh, but there is something that I want to preserve that, that I, I don't think co-ops solve everything. Um, and this is one of the places where I, I don't think it's actually the right incentive to have a business model for that. It's a good point. It's a very good point. I'm not going to argue it. Um, we were blasting through some of the Q and A um, with written answers as well. So if your question is no longer in the open questions, it, it might've been, uh, look for the typed answer. Um, it looks like there's a couple more there and we ha only have about eight more minutes. So maybe we can hit those. One is addressing the theme of burnout and the other one is talking about uh, taking power and, and the conversation about uh, cooperative rehabilitation centers uh, maybe we can start with that one because it actually bridges with the last thing that we were just talking about. Do do y'all have thoughts? Should I read it? Do you want to read it? You're giving me a thumbs up. You can read it. Go ahead. Oh no, you you're on. Okay, I'll, I'll read. Okay. Um, this one about taking power. What do y'all think about cooperatively? rehabilitation centers, transformative centers that may be able to win prison contracts out from under privately owned prisons. Oh, I'm so glad Lydia is live and in the room. <laughs> Let's talk about private prisons and how it's a red herring distraction and actually the profit motive is not the main reason for the entrenchment of the carceral state that white supremacy is interested uh, even at a loss in continuing to incarcerate uh, disproportionately poor and, and black people, um, even without a private prison profit motive. Go ahead, Lydia. I think you said it all. Um, <laughs> I think that, no, I, and, I, and, I, and I say this with love and kindness, um, because this is the, um, every time I teach my class on the carceral state, this is one of the first conversations we have on day one, right? Why are we in the classroom? And this is a large story, right? And I think it's important to know um, for folks who are unaware <laughs> that somewhere between, on a, in a given year, six to 8% of um, prisons in America are privately managed, right? Six to 8%, it's a very small piece of the pie. Um, and there was a real under moment in the 90s when this kind of showed up um, where there was a lot of um, understandable fear. This was kind of the move that was going to be happening because the history of convict leasing was a predominantly um, privately managed system before 
before we moved to the chain gang, right? There was a, there was a precedent that people understood to be connected. And um, I say this because a couple of things, right? Um, right? It's not the, right, the, 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 the violence of incarceration um, is, is in and of itself a bad enough thing, right? Um, so as Ruthie Wilson Gilmore always says, right? If we fight all day for them 100% to be public, that doesn't get anyone out, right? It doesn't get anyone free. It, doesn't, uh, it, it just legitimizes the public system even more as part of kind of a, a, a normal or healthy operation of kind of how we run a criminal legal system in society um, writ large. So that's one piece. And with that said, I think what there's really, there's a great book out there. Um, so, and, I, and I should say this, I'm not interested in running any prisons um, in any way, shape or form. And I think that there is something very deep. Um, there's this great book called When the Prisoners Ran Walpole, which is about when a prisoner union literally ran uh, the Massachusetts Correctional Institute, I think, of Walpole, a Walpole um, in the 70s for a number of months. Um, and, and because of reformist warden and a whole series of factors led to these folks to organize this, this prisoner union and organize to run the prison. Um, and, and literally the guards left because they were kind of freaked out about it. And it's a really great book. It's a very slim book. Um, I'm actually not sure how you get it now because it was a South End Press book, which has since gone under. So I'm not, but I'm sure there's a PDF floating around on the internet. If you Google when the prisoners ran Walpole PDF, I'm sure someone has uploaded this to the internet. Um, but I, I, I say this, because what's really notable is um, even this former warden, whose name I can't remember, and, and the prisoner, and it was a multiracial prisoners union that both centered anti-racist politics and the centrality of anti-Black racism, and also had a deeply kind of multiracial organizing strategy inside, is that they tell the story that it pushed them to be abolitionists. Like it actually pushed the prisoners themselves. It pushed the, this reformist warden um, who would later in like the 90s and early 2000s often go and talk at like kind of anti-prison conferences. Um, and so I just really share that as something to think about, about how, um, right, the system, it, the system is not broken, right? The system is, it, we can't reform a system that is not broken, right? It, it, it's operating as it, as it is designed to operate, which is to steal um, hours, years, which is to say lives of people um, and physical incapacitation, right? Um, in very deep, profound ways. And there's no way of getting around that. And so the question I always come back to is, right, how do we move from a belief, either if it's through a framework of punishment or paternalism, that there is something profoundly wrong enough with people that the only answer is to put them somewhere else, right? Is to banish them, to concentrate them to terrible disease, premature death, um, and you know, fracture which is which is anti-human, right? Like fundamental. This is my anthropologist hat, just sticking it on for a second. Mm -hmm. Former life as an anthropologist, that fundamentally humans are about cooperation, collaboration. Include like that we we are a social communal species. So it is the most dehumanizing thing to remove people from community. That mm -hmm. is what we talk about. That when we're centering an abolitionist framework versus a reformist one. I saw something I think today or yesterday on Instagram, someone was posting about how there are currently more black people incarcerated in the United States than there are incarcerated in the entire African continent. Like what is even going on, right? So it, it points to a very clear, like our work should be very clear. It is not about like, how do we shrink this and tweak that about the conditions of um, of cages, which is what we're talking about, right? But actually, like, how do we build a world where we're not criminalizing people and we're not seeing that as the solution for harm or violence? There's other stuff that we have to do. Right, and the way we started out, right, we were talking about racialized capitalism, right? Most of the issues about public safety, right, that everybody's either in arms about or trying to use um, arrest and prisons for, right? are really right fabricated issues about you know institutional racism anti-blackness fabricated issues in order to control um, black people right and so if we understand that as the basis for what most of the problems are then we realize that the right that the solutions have to be more about change and transforming our our social economic our political economy, right? Not so much about trying to reform those institutions that the ra the racialized capitalist political economy is putting in place to keep itself in place. 
Yes, this is a beautiful note to start to close on at 6.59. I wanted to just real quick fit in that I think arts and culture is such an important piece to really actualizing all of these visions. Um, and so I put a link in the chat to um, a report that was recently authored and released, um, put together by Nati Linares at um, New Economy Coalition um, about the ways art and culture can be a part of engaging the systems change work. So check that out when you have a chance. Um, any final words before we hop off here, y'all? I just want to say one thing real quick, and then I hope others have final thoughts. But I think that there is something powerful of solidarity economics and cooperatives, right? Where if we are able to undo the thinking that we need a boss, right? A very specific kind of boss, or we need a specific kind of landlord, right? Or these different relationships. I think it's the same kind of way we can start. It's the same kind of thinking to say, we don't need a police, right? We don't need a prison, right? It's the same, and, and they're so interconnected. And I think that we as, um, people working in these fields are so primed um, for thinking in these ways and imagining and practicing the different kinds of infrastructure building, as Esteban put it, that we're gonna need to really um, create the different types of worlds that meet people um, to survive and thrive in all of the ways we know that they can. I'd just like to thank, um, thank the organizers of this event for having invited me and I enjoyed the conversation. And I'm sure there will be many more because we're not free yet. Yeah, ditto that, ditto that, Ed. I was like furiously typing in the Q and A, which I know for the recording you're probably gonna miss, but um, some of the questions <laughs> made sure that we clear them all out, answered them, <laughs> have to feel like settled and complete about it. I'm sorry if the answers were rushed and um, not uh, comprehensive, but uh, but I wanted to make at least make sure we hit on them. I'm um, so glad you were able to join us, Lydia, because I learned so much from you. Um, this feels like a whole panel of all my mentors, Ed and Jessica. Thank you so much for all of your mentorship. Um, I learned from you every day. I've learned from you today. Uh, this is what it is. Like, there's no freedom without solidarity. It, it's it's instructive for how we get uh, to emancipation. So thank you all. And thanks to Gio for uh, being the co-sponsor and along with the Federation. Thanks everybody to the third, maybe there'll be a third one. <laughs> There's, you know, as, as Ed said, we're still not free. So we still have to talk about these things. We still have to figure out how to become, how to liberate ourselves. Right on. And with that, wishing you all a well Tuesday. Um, yeah, take care. And here's to our freedom and abolition. Good night. Thank you all. Good night.